Welcome back to another episode of the We Live to Build podcast. This is 121 with John Kozeski, the founder and principal of John Thomas Consulting, a full service consulting firm experienced in government affairs, grant strategy, association management, resource development, and marketing strategy, and more. His firm has helped all sorts of companies, institutions, and nonprofits alike around the world. We'll be hearing about his experience with working with nonprofits and how nonprofits can actually be profitable and his experiences traveling to Africa and other countries to help all sorts of really cool companies and, and institutions. So thank you for taking the time to talk with me, John. I appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about yourself and how you got into this and we'll go from there. Absolutely. Thank you, Sean. I'm glad to be on the show today. So uh, my background, I, I've been in this space for about 17 years before that. Uh, I actually, my first uh, iteration of a career, I started out with uh, my local fire department and, and I loved the opportunity for four years to serve my community and, and just be a contributing mem member of the community. And, and that really instilled in me a, a spirit of service. So from there, I went on to work on Capitol Hill in Washington, D.C., I worked for my local congressman in Ohio, and later I worked for Senator Hil Hillary Clinton in uh, from the state of New York. So I, uh, my, the congressman was a Republican. Obviously, Senator Clinton was a Democrat, so I was very bipartisan in, in working with both sides of the aisle. Uh, but in both of those roles, I had the opportunity to work with nonprofits and small businesses in our districts to identify federal pots of money. Uh, access those program managers, and then even give advice as to you know what that session of Congress was looking to fund so they could really work to hone their message in their grant applications. So after a couple of years of doing that, it was the natural progression, uh, just go into the private sector and actually start writing those grants. Uh, so I started very high level medical device, medical research grants with a group affiliated with the Cleveland Clinic in Ohio. Um, I loved the work. It was fascinating, the, the cutting edge science and everything else. Uh, that the biotechnology community has. But after a few years, I, I realized my real passion was, was in the smaller nonprofit space, helping the neighborhood and community groups uh, that really didn't have a voice. They, they were getting passed over for a lot of the bigger dollars. Uh, and really, they were the groups that those dollars could have the biggest impact directly on the community. Uh, so what started out as just grant writing quickly evolved, uh, as anybody who's worked in a nonprofit knows. Uh, if you work in a nonprofit, you wear all the hats because there's not many people and, and everybody's overworked. Uh, so grant writing quickly became donor stewardship. It quickly became managing and planning events. It became our uh, individual donor appeals and things of that nature, social media. Um, and then it evolved into overall organization management. So if you're going to wear all those hats for some organizations, we started wearing the executive director hat as well uh, for groups that wanted to outsource uh, their executive director roles. And so now I'm, I'm very proud to say that uh, we just celebrated our 10th anniversary as a company, uh, and we've been able to raise over just over $100 million for our clients all around the world. Uh, there was a point last year where we were on uh, six continents, and uh, uh, currently we're on five, uh, which we'll dig into here in a minute. But uh, we're really proud of what we've accomplished. Congrats on the $100 million and congrats on 10 years. That's pretty cool. Some people might think that running a nonprofit shouldn't be considered entrepreneurial because the goal isn't profit. Help me to destroy that. <laughs> I think it is my mission to help uh, nonprofit professionals to destroy that idea because anyone that thinks uh, that they're going to start a nonprofit and think it's simpler or any different than starting a restaurant or uh, you know an ice cream stand down the street is completely mistaken. They are starting a small business. Uh, there are customers, and those are twofold. Those are in both the individuals that you're serving. So you have to find what it is, where there's a void that you can fill, just like an entrepreneur would, and how you're better equipped to fill that void than someone else, just like an entrepreneur. But you also have the stakeholders that are your investors. So just like you would with a small business, these are going to be individuals that are donating to you. These are institutions and, and granting foundations that are saying to you, you go out and you make this money and you make a difference with it, just like an entrepreneur does. So you have to take all of this into consideration. And then you have to have all the regular skills of an entrepreneur. So you have to have marketing skills. How, how are you going to appeal to both of those quote unquote customer bases that we just talked about? 
uh, you have to have a financial background. You have to be able to balance your books and scrutinize every dollar coming in and going out, just like an entrepreneur does. It, it's absolutely no different. You have to have human resources skills. I mean, nonprofits, as they grow, either have volunteers or employees that need to be managed, that have to be appreciated, that have to show up to work every day and have a clear mission that you're leading them on to make a difference. So overall, I, I always say uh, that you are you're, you're just starting a business that's that's not going to make a that's not going to turn a profit. How would a nonprofit juggle operational spending versus spending on the mission? Right, because they're very different. They are extremely different, and I will say one of the more difficult parts, uh, especially when it comes to donors and in, uh, grant funders, things of that nature. More and more, we're seeing groups saying, we don't want our money going to uh, organizational spending. We don't want it to go towards overhead, as they call it. But we all know that to run a business or to run a nonprofit, it takes overhead. There is no question about it. I mean, some organizations can be 100% uh, volunteer led, uh, pushing you know 100% of their dollars into the community. And that's wonderful, but it's very hard to scale that kind of impact. And it's very hard to grow and, and really, honestly, it's really hard, I say, to scrutinize those dollars because it's volunteers. So they're not there every day balancing the books deep into the figures, making sure every dollar is accounted for. So I always make the argument to institutional funders or donors of you actually want some overhead because that's how you ensure that your dollars are being properly spent. I know when I was in China, my first supposed business actually ended up getting pigeonholed as a nonprofit by the people. So basically it was a, a live speech event. And the guy I started it with, his his goal was, I don't want to charge people for this, you know, let, like I don't want them to pay for the tickets, but like we could sell coffee and drinks and all that and that, like use that to pay for, you know, whatever we need, whether we're renting a room, et cetera. And after that event, it became almost impossible to start charging for because we had a hundred people at that event. And then we got 250 at the next event. And then we had 400 at the next event, right? And then the government picked us up and they started get, like sponsoring us with media coverage and uh, other sorts of opportunities where we, we basically couldn't charge. And so we had to do like, okay, you can buy water, you can buy the VIP dinner and all that. And between all of those things, my partner and I barely made enough money to cover our own costs. And we were doing this full time. So I, I ended up actually going broke doing it for two years, but it was an incredible experience the entire time. And I, I, I tried desperately to like get people to donate, to give us, you know, grants or funding in a sizable manner so that we could, you know, build a team because I was doing everything on that wasn't on the day, right? I would spend the entire month finding the guests, scheduling them, preparing their speeches with them, making sure their PowerPoints made sense, getting them in advance so I could put them all together, uh, you know, dealing with the videographer and the, the uh, other people that were going to be taking photos and making, you know, meeting with the volunteers to make sure they were actually going to show up and, and what, they knew what they did. And I had to create, doc, you know, standard operating procedure documents for all of them. So they knew, you know, and I, I had a diagram of the venue. So they knew w what spots they were going to be standing in and, and based on that spot, what role they were going to be playing that day. And, um, on top of, you know, creating marketing materials and doing promotion and going out and promoting the events at bars and clubs and, and other places where, you know, other events where people would be. It's like, it was 80 hour a week job. I was getting like $200 a month to do it all. I was in China. So like I wasn't dying, but I still couldn't pay for anything. And, uh, it was extremely frustrating because I couldn't build a team to help me full time. So I, I totally understand. And that's why I was like, I'm never doing nonprofit again. But what I what I learned from that experience, I was like 26, 27. And what I learned from that experience was you should never attempt to help people until you can take care of yourself first. Because if you can't take care of yourself, you don't have the energy to help others. Uh, there's someone I know, he calls it uh, serving people without a cup that's full. Right? He's like, if, you're, if your cup's not full, you can't fill other people's cups. That's a hundred percent right. So I totally understand the operational spending. That's why I asked the question and I'm like, yep. you can't do anything without people, you know, at some point. Cause like, cause we had, we had 
government officials from other parts of China flying to our events and offering for us to set up in their cities too. And I'm like, I can barely handle the thing I have now. How am I supposed to do this? Because it's a, it wasn't a, an online thing, right? It's not like you can scale globally by just having people promote you in different you know regions. Like, no, you have to physically set up. Just couldn't do it. Had no ability to scale. I guarantee anyone that works in a nonprofit or has worked at a nonprofit that's listening today is saying, I know exactly what you're talking about. Working 80 hours a week, being wildly underpaid. Uh, and that's why, you know, you really find one of two types of people in nonprofits. It's either people that are, uh, you know, able financially at a point in their life to now give back to the community, or it's people that are entirely passionate about the cause and, and they don't care what they make because they live and die by the people that they're able to serve. Uh, and, and so it, it, it is a labor of passion, as you found out, uh, certainly over those two years. Yes. What was important was the relationships I built out of that. And I'm still close friends with a, with a number of the, the speakers and audience members uh, from that event. And, and that's really cool, you know, because I've known them now for almost 10 years, some of them. That's incredible. So beyond what I just expressed, what are the other huge problems that you've seen in running a nonprofit? It's no different than running a business. So you run into... For example, I mean, you know, we're heading into a recession here in the United States and, and arguably globally. And so, you know, that the same way customers get tighter with their dollars, so do donors, so do institutional funders, even for that matter. And so that becomes very difficult where you have to be able to pivot and change parts of your mission and, and be able to realize where you can cut uh, to still survive. Um, I think there's always the problem of trying to stand out. I mean, there is a record number of nonprofits in the United States today. Uh, it is an incredible figure and it's, it's into the millions. And so knowing that and still trying to figure out a way that you can stand out amongst all that noise to donors, to funders, um, you know, and I think we saw a lot of that during COVID. I mean, um, just like small businesses, a number of nonprofits had to close their doors because it was even more difficult to stand out in this electronic environment. Um, you know, arguably some of that is good though, um, because to a certain extent, those people didn't go away. Uh, they were able to join forces with a lot of other nonprofits that were like-minded uh, and be able to create what we call collective impact, uh, which is something that a lot of funders want to see today. So anyone looking to raise money for their nonprofits or even start a nonprofit, it is tremendously uh, important to find others that you can work together with. And, and that's something that we've seen a lot in the last few years. So how can a nonprofit actually stand out? You know, there, there's different ways to do it. Uh, you know, first and foremost is to be, um, you know, transparent. Uh, the, the more transparent you can be with your donors and with your funders, uh, the better. And, and that is to have clean books. That is to always have reporting standards. Uh, there are uh, companies like GuideStar and others that actually rate nonprofits and a lot more funders are turning to those organizations now uh, to uh, delineate between groups. I think getting very creative in your marketing standards nowadays is really important. You know, gone are the days where you can just write a few things on Facebook and hope that the dollars will come in. I mean, we're pushing ourselves to basically become marketing experts as to how do we stand out, what, what resonates amongst our donors and what doesn't. Um, and, and so that's a, a fun and unique challenge. And really at the end of the day, it's no different than a small business. It's being the best at what you do. So finding ways to benefit the most number of people that you can with the least amount of dollars and still make a difference. Those facts and figures really are what are important. So you said, uh, accounting standards, you're referring to gap. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So for anyone who doesn't know what gap is, it's generally accepted accounting principles. And I interviewed someone about this like 50, 60 episodes ago. Uh, her name was Angela Rice. So if you're interested in knowing more about uh, CFO practices, accounting practices, how to protect yourself from people screwing around with your books, uh, you know, your employees or partners, then definitely go check out that episode. So we've established that being a nonprofit generally is way harder than being a profitable business, mostly because you're constantly fundraising. You're not really allowed to spend the money that you're fundraising for 
like building a team, managing the team and, and marketing yourself to be able to be sustainable, which leads me to the idea that I had years ago, which was why don't all nonprofits run profitable activities and just use that profit to support themselves. And, and sometimes that's another company. So they'll say, uh, I'm going to create a second company. This company is going to offer services. There's multiple ways of looking at it. I'm curious to know what you think is the most common one. Um, but I've heard of like a nonprofit starting as a for-profit and then using profit to create the nonprofit and fund it, which is something that I was hoping to do with my tech company, uh, where we were for-profit to start with the concept of let's use 10% of our profit to just fund another, you know, nonprofit, um, or getting, uh, for profitable companies to pledge a yearly amount of their profit in percent. So you don't have to beg every year um, or having your nonprofit actually do things that generate income so that you can use that money for your own operating expenses. And, you know, the donations and grants and all that can just go directly to, you know, what you're, so there's, there's many different ways of thinking about it. What percentage of companies, what percentage of nonprofits do you think, think this way and what percentage of them are actually doing something in this realm? You know, I think the only answer to that is not enough. Uh, and because what, exactly what you just described there works both ways, and I've seen it wildly successful. So, you know, some great examples of that are um, schools for, for, for students that are looking, you know, non-traditional uh, course of education. And, and then what I've seen very successful is that once they graduate, they create businesses of their own, where they go out and do service in the community, and that generates funds back to the nonprofit school, so that they can continue that uh, that that service. And that's everything from landscaping to uh, restaurants and things of that nature, pet care. I mean, it's really some incredible, incredible things that we all use every day. And if you can do some global good with the money you are going to spend, regardless, then then why not? And so that message works very well for those nonprofits. On the flip side. Uh, you know, you really hit the nail on the head on the other part of it is for profit businesses that realize, hey, you know what, my services that I offer, there's a lot of people out there that can't afford them. And I can't afford to give it away for free. But that's where they my services would do the most good. Um, and so a lot of those for profits, then will start nonprofit entities uh, that go out and pursue funding, essentially, that offsets the cost of their services to underserved communities to utilize that. Now, you know, keep in mind, uh, it, it, there are laws that regulate how much can be spent directly to the for-profit company. There still has to be a, a proper bidding process. They can't just be a pass-through. Uh, and even a certain amount of their, their income has to go to auxiliary services. Uh, so not just to their for-profit company, but to other entities as well. But generally, again, that goes back to that collective impact where their nonprofit can work with other groups that augment their services that they're offering. So at the end of the day, everybody wins. So you're saying there's for-profit companies that will go out and, and look for grants? I mean, there's grants out there that for-profit companies can certainly go for. Most of them are around workforce development or job creation, um, expansion, uh, buying buildings and properties, things like that. Um, and those, those have always been available. But 90% of grants that are out there are for... Um, uh, nonprofit entities. And so that's where a lot of for-profits find that nonprofit part to either, again, pay for some of their services to groups that otherwise couldn't afford it. And you see that a lot in counseling services and other social services that are for-profit companies that are trying to expand their reach. Um, but also too, they're just using it as an arm to do good. And, and sometimes those nonprofit entities are just an affiliate of the for-profit um, and, and could do a, an array of things. So if you're running a for-profit and you don't really have the energy to set up a nonprofit and go hunting for grants and all of that, what's, what are some things that you can do to support nonprofits or, or community or anything like that? You know, there's a lot of different ways to go about that. And what's exciting to me is, you know, having been in this business now for, like I said, 17 years, I've seen more corporate citizenship in the last four years uh, than at any other point in my career. And the trajectory is very positive. Uh, you know, forever the, you know, the local store in the corner would sponsor the the kids baseball team or the Boy Scouts or whatever that is. And that still continues today. And believe me, that's the lifeblood of a lot of those smaller nonprofits. Um, you know, you see 
sponsorships and things like that with medium sized companies. And then even the larger companies are putting so much more emphasis on what's called corporate social responsibility giving or CSR. And they're hiring full time staff and in some cases departments that manage that corporate citizenship. What can we be doing in the community? This isn't our foundation giving money. This is our actual corporation putting money into the community to solve a need. And so, you know, we're seeing a lot more of that. But, you know, for those people that have for profits that say, hey, you know what, we're heading into a recession and we can barely get by. So the idea of me giving away, uh, you know, five and six figure sums of money probably isn't in the cards for 2023. You know, I, I say, look around to your workforce. I mean, a lot of times we have staff that, you know, we, we all have down days, you know, whether that's, you know, a certain day of the week or a certain day of the month where business is slower and you could be deploying that you're still paying your employees. So you could be deploying them into the community to volunteer at nonprofits that both create goodwill for your company, certainly, uh, but also create good in the community of which they serve as well. I love that. That's really cool. I don't know why I hadn't thought of that. But it's really it's it's a really cool idea to go. Yeah, what's something you're passionate about? You got no work today. Go ahead, go do this thing. The only thing is, there there are definitely some people. <laughs> I I'm already thinking of like people that I used to work with. Like I know there's people to be like, oh yeah, I'm gonna go do this thing, and then they just don't. They get paid to basically sit around and and smoke weed and watch Netflix. A hundred percent. But even even in that case, you know, if you're a CEO and that's what you're worried about, yeah, it's unfortunate that your employee decided to do that. But there's also the goodwill that you created with your employee that, you know, we're, we're in an age where it's the employees are running the table, not the employers. I mean, they can go from job to job. And so if they see a CEO or a boss that is, you know what, this this person wants me to go out into the community and do some good or they're trusting me to not come into work today and just that, you know, they have that faith in me. They're gonna, you're going to create goodwill in your employees, too. And that's going to go a long way to longevity. Yeah, unfortunately, there's some people that are very willing to take advantage over the long term. And it's one of the struggles has been trying to figure out who that is, who that type of person is and which specific people in any organization are the ones actually taking advantage. Because um, some people can be really efficient. So, for example, uh, my brother his stated goal in life is I want a 40 hour per week job that I can automate. So I only need to do 20 hours of work per week. Like some people would go, Oh, that's, that's disingenuous, but he would go. Yeah. But I've actually made the company more efficient by me not needing to spend 20 extra hours a week on that thing. It's just your fault for not realizing that I haven't, that, that I have the extra 20 hours a week to do other stuff, other stuff for you. That is what has always been my mantra at John Thomas Consulting to all of my team is work smarter, not harder. I don't care if you're working 20 hours a week or 80 hours a week. If you're getting the job done, I have nothing to complain about. And the rest of the time is yours. So I want to circle back kind of the corporate social responsibility. I have a friend in China who for the last five years or so has been running a corporate social responsibility firm. And basically his pitch was, hey, you companies are making tremendous amounts of money. And if you want people to hate you a little bit less, you should give me some money and I'm going to make you look good by doing stuff for society with it and saying you're the one that did it. And he would, I think he takes like 10 or 15% of what they, they give him. So let's say their budget is a million dollars. He's going to take 100, 150K and go, all right, this is my cut. And he does like millions of dollars a year off of these large companies, just like giving him money, like just throwing money. I think one company gave him like $30 million one year to just like spend to make them look good. I'm like, I should start a corporate social responsibility for, you know, it's the business to be in if you can get into it. But I'll say what's equally interesting, you know, the same way those corporations have clearing houses, these multi multi millionaires and billionaires today have the same clearing houses. They exist. There are entire firms that exist and they have two or three clients at most. And their job is just to give away these funds. I mean, it's been a race for all nonprofits to try to identify, you know, who's that clearing house for the Mackenzie Scotts of the world that are just, you know, sprinkling $20 million on school districts and uh, food pantries, you know, who, who's making those decisions because it's, it's not Mackenzie Scott that's doing it. I, I think of uh, Mr. Beast. I don't know if you've heard of him. Mr. Beast has over a hundred million followers on YouTube. Oh, wow. <laughs> and he started out about eight or nine years ago 
and he's like involved in Minecraft and other things. But what he does the biggest is philanthropy. So basically, like in every one of his videos, he's giving away money, right? He started off giving out $100. He's now giving away the, the last video he did. He gave away a $2.5 million private jet. <laughs> And what, what, so what he, what he is known for doing in some of them is like, all right, I'm going to put you next to this jet. You're going to put your hand on this jet and whoever takes their hand off last gets it, but it's not yours. You have to give it to someone else. Oh, wow. <laughs> and like, he's given away isl private islands that are worth like a million dollars. So like he gets paid by brands to promote them in the process of doing this good for society. He's bought people houses who were homeless. He's bought people cars where their cars weren't working anymore. He's done all like, he must have already given away like a few hundred million dollars, probably. <laughs> He'll go into like Walmart and go, hey, uh, if you quit your job right now, I'll give you $10,000. And they're like, okay. Or, uh, you know, here's, here's $10,000. I want you to go give it to someone else that you have to give it to the next person you see. And you've got 30 seconds to do it. Right. So he does all sorts of like these really interesting, um, and the, the, and the bigger they get, the bigger, the things are, but the whole thing is he, his model is give me as much money as you can. And I'm going to give more of it away than you give me. And I'm going to do it because I want to help people because life is hard and people are struggling. And like, if, if at least one person doesn't cry in one of his videos, like the video is a failure, basically. You know, it's amazing. And, you know, I love videos like that because, you know, they're entertaining and all that. But most importantly, I, I always hope that they're inspiring to people to realize, you know what, you may not be able to give away a private jet or an island, but maybe you can give away 20 bucks or maybe you can buy the coffee for somebody behind you at Starbucks. And, you know, it, to that person, it's just as exciting and it's just as inspiring. And so, you know, that those sorts of things can really have a, a really positive spiral effect. Yeah, there's there's times when it's like when I was in Portugal, uh, there were a few people that would that were clearly homeless hanging out around supermarkets and you would see person after person walking by, ignoring them and like, fair enough, they're sitting out there. They're trying to, you know, the, for whatever reason, they're hoping people will give them something without having to really do anything for it. And it's so hard to know if they really need help or if they're just lazy, right? And so like I've, I've had different kinds of people come up to me. Some have, like one guy was like, I need aspirin. Like he showed me a medication list and he's like, I'm out of aspirin. Like, do you have aspirin? I'm like, no, I don't, I'm not carrying aspirin on me. But like, I think he may have like needed meds to like to take care of himself. So like, in those situations, it's like, if I can help, yeah, I'm going to help. But like, if you just ask for money, then no. Like I, I was at uh, Wells Fargo Bank yesterday trying to get some notary work done. And a woman stopped me before I entered. And she's like, look, this is my car. And I'm out of gas. I have no cash on me. Like, can you give, you know, can you give me, you know, a few dollars for like a gallon? I was like, I don't have cash on me. She's like, oh, well, you know, can you go into the bank and get cash? I'm like, I don't have an account with Wells Fargo. I'm just going to get a notary service done. So like in that situation, it's like, yeah, I know it's only a few bucks, but like, is she just trying to pawn a few dollars off me? Like, like who is this person? Right. So it's, it's so hard to know genuine need from like scammers. And there's so many scammers. It's so very true. And and there are, and there's, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and say there aren't bad people out there because there surely are. And trust me, running as many charitable groups as we do, we unfortunately come across them and we rec we can usually recognize it pretty quick when somebody is just trying to take advantage of goodwill. Um, you know, at the same time though, you, you really highlighted as a society, we, we have become very cynical and, and because we have to be uh, and, and to protect ourselves in certain cases. But, you know, a great example of that is, you know, I, I run a pediatric cancer foundation and, and we provide emergency financial support to the families while the children are in treatment. And, you know, we've run into a lot of organizations that say, you know, that's great. You know, certainly we, we want to help the kids, but what's wrong with mom and dad? Why can't they provide for them? You know, why can't they, you know, work a little harder? And, and we really have to lay out that, you know, you don't understand you know, when a child's in treatment five days a week, six hours a day, I mean, Nine times out of ten, if it, if they're fortunate enough to be a two parent home, one of them is taking leaving their job because this becomes a full time job. 
because then you have to be with the child at home. You have to make sure they're taking their medications. And then once we start to draw that out and then, you know, think of, we, we illustrate, you know, you go from a, a two, two income family to a one income family and you have all these medical expenses and you're parking at the hospital and you're eating takeout because you're away from home for hours every day. Um, it's very, very quick to fall behind on the bills. And so we find, you know, back to your example, we, we really have to illustrate what the need is and why that need is there before people open their wallets. Yeah, I came across this really cool TikTok account like a month or so ago. There's a guy, I don't know where in America, runs like a gas station and like a, uh, it's like a 7-Eleven kind of a store, like right? there's like a little store attached to it. And he will show people that are clearly homeless or or really poor coming into a store and trying to buy things and like you know they're, they're not trying to steal or anything they're just trying to do the thing like they need something and like he'll tell their stories on tiktok and then his followers will then like donate money because they they feel bad for these people and they want to help and there was this and, and so part of his videos he'll show follow-ups to their stories where he's like, where they come in the next time and he starts recording and he'll like say, Oh, you know, my followers sent $500 and like a pair of shoes because they know they, they, they saw your shoes were falling apart. It's like, I, I love to see that. He's got like 400,000 followers on TikTok, And he had this, this one woman and her son, and the son needed some, some kind of surgery. And the woman like would make street food. She had like a food stall. So he actually had someone make her a new food cart because hers was, was falling apart. And he like pre-filled it with all of the ingredients she needed for like, I guess a few days. And uh, the, the subscribers to his channel ended up donating like, like $10,000 towards his surgery so that she didn't have to work so hard uh, during the next you know month or two so she could be with him and spend time with him and pay for part of the surgery. It's like, it's so cool to see stuff like that in particular because those people are a part of his community. And even though he's not putting his own money into it, or if he is, he's not putting too much, but sometimes he'll like give them, you know, like something for free when they come and say, Oh yeah, you know, here's another, here's a coffee or here's, you know, whatever, something, but it's just cool. I know this is completely not entrepreneurship, but, um, I just love seeing people like that. I love seeing these stories and they're documenting the need and people are responding because he's not even asking people for money he's just saying this is this person's story i thought you'd want to know about it i would make the case the other way that that is entrepreneurship so you know we we all have you know our social media channels and things of that nature and some people do it to show you know hey look at me look how cool i am or look how good my life is or blah 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 and then you got cases like that and and really what i'd like to think we all hope to be where people are using their social media to build a following so they have customers that are coming in and they're looking for inspiration they're looking for a way to give back they're looking for a way to be involved and that's somebody who's wildly successful at doing it and again you know that's inspiring to me and others that they're using their tools to do good and clearly by their follower account they're doing very good at it so you know in, in its own way it's almost like a, a non-profit social media account which is very cool yeah many years ago my dad was on uh one of those talk shows i can't remember um monta williams he was on monta williams and monta williams like wanted my dad to do a makeover for someone who was homeless or like very or, or poor and so my, my dad did it. It was like probably $15,000 worth of work. And it was like a complete makeover. The guy's mouth was just destroyed. Right? My dad's a dentist. And it was great publicity, but I felt like it didn't really help his business. Like he was doing something good. He, my, my dad knew that there was going to be publicity. He knew that it was going to look good but I don't think it turned into something that would have enabled him to help more people, which I think he was bummed about. And I was bummed about because I loved it. I, I met the guy multiple times. I was th there the whole time as my dad was planning out what we were going to We I, I've worked with him multiple times in the past. So I, I still bundle us together. I spent years of my life working in his business. And uh, so I, it was cool to see it happen. Um, but it didn't scale in a way that he could make more money so he could also then offer to help other people because 
like he's not a great businessman, but he's an amazing dentist and he's super caring about like everybody. And um, I wish more businesses had the ability to make so much money that they could just go, yeah, I'm going to give back. Right. So for example, there's a guy, Alex Hermosi. I don't know if you've heard of him. So his business model is if you're making less than $3 million a year, I'm going to teach you how to make $3 million per year. And I'm never going to charge you a single cent because I want you to get to that point. So then I can invest in you and turn your company into a hundred million dollar company. So there's stuff like that. That's really cool. So like what I'd like to be able to do is, you know, with my consulting firm, I'd like to be able to make so much that I can afford to have the time to mentor people who are just starting out in their entrepreneurship journey. I did it before when I was doing my consulting years ago and I loved it. It was really, really cool. No, those are, those are the cool stories that I like to hear. And, and, you know, what's interesting is, you know, speaking of your dad, it, it reminds me of a, another group that I work with that their model we're seeing a lot more of, and I think it's probably because of experiences like your dad's. So in particular, this is a, a free dental clinic. It's in the uh, Maasai region of Kenya. So for those not familiar, that's about seven hours outside the capital. It's as rural as rural can get, and there is absolutely no oral health care. And so in recognizing that they built this free clinic because they also recognize that there's dentists like your dad from all around the world that want to volunteer their time. They don't have millions and millions to give away, but they have two weeks perhaps that they can take off of work. They can afford to do that. They're going to take a vacation anyway. So they take the time to fly into this area. They provide, you know, the patients cause there's always a line out the door every day. Um, and give them the opportunity to 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 perform those those free operations like your dad you know was really really looking to dig into uh and you know we find that you know dentists come for two weeks and then they stay for six weeks and then they come back year after year because they had that same experience that your dad had on montel uh and that's really cool to see there is something very different about doing something for money and doing something because it feels good and even better when you're doing something for free because you can afford to, even though you would normally make money doing it. And that's the entrepreneurial cycle right there. I mean, that is it in a nutshell is there is nothing that feels better in the world than when that first person pays you for whatever your skills are. When you hang out your shingle and you say, this is what I'm going to do. And somebody walks in and says, I'm going to give you money to do it. You're on top of the world. And the only thing that beats it is when you get through that cycle and you get to the point where you're able to give it away for free and people want it and they they stand in line for that service even though they can't afford it but they know you're the best at what you do and they can utilize it and you can afford to do it for them um those two feelings together really are that entrepreneurial cycle that we all experience or we hope to experience so when do you anticipate you'll be there i'm always cautious to say this especially on a podcast but uh i'm really excited to say that we've been there now for a few years uh, you know, we we have a number of clients that we take on pro bono every year. Uh, it's really important to me amongst the John Thomas consulting team that every member of the team every year can bring in at least one client that can't afford our services that uh, that they genuinely want to work with. And so we give them the time in their calendar to work directly with those organizations as they would any paying employee. And then I think on the flip side of that, the other thing we're able to do is, you know, a lot of times with our paying employee or paying clients, excuse me, uh, you know, if, if for some reason they're at a point where, you know, they can't afford our services, whether that be at the beginning of a contract and we just want to get them to the point where they can, um, or if they have some kind of capital expenditure that, uh, you know, we recognize that we want to be a part of so we can say, you know what, forego our pay for a month, two months, three months so that you can do that. Um, you know, we're really fortunate as a company that that's one way that we can get back. I am part of multiple entrepreneur communities and a lot of them are starting out. So they're at, at the point where I was mentoring people before for free, where I would love to work with them, but they can't afford to pay me and I can't afford to work with them for free right now. And so like, I know that it would take months of my effort to get them to a point where they might be able to afford me, which is a shame because I think they're all doing really interesting businesses and I would love to work with them. They're, they're interesting. They're hardworking. They're like in their early twenties, a lot of them. And, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm trying to like juggle that. I would just spend an hour yesterday giving this one guy free advice on a really cool business. And, uh, 
So I'm like, look, I would normally never tell anyone to raise funds, but like, I think you need to raise funds. And if you decide to raise funds, you know, then we can work together in a more uh, professional capacity long term. But, but if you can't, you know, if you don't want to raise the funds and, and you can't afford to work with me, then, you know, maybe we can talk about something equity based so that I can earn the equity. Back in uh, 2012, when I started my company, that's exactly what I was doing was I was hanging out at, uh, we, we had some local business incubators. So these were really, really startups, very similar probably to the ones that you're talking about. And they, they couldn't, they were barely getting by. I mean, they could barely afford the desk that they were sitting, renting that the same way I could barely afford the desk that I was renting. Um, but where we, we really started to get interesting was, you know, what I was saying to them was, you know, hey, does your spouse, do your parents, do you have family that work at companies that maybe could use my services? Because if you can introduce me to them, if you can get my foot in the door and that results in a contract, then, hey, I'm happy to, you know, put in some volunteer hours to help you because uh, in, you know, roundabout way, you just paid me. Uh, and so, you know, this can be a quid pro quo situation. And there was a number of groups that I was fortunate enough to work with based off of those kinds of arrangements. That's really cool. I, I mean, I do that now uh, with guests and other people that I know, I ask them about their networks, but usually I, I don't offer to work with them. I, I usually just offer like a commission. Some of them say they will, they're cool. Others say, yeah, I don't need a commission, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, the smaller sized ones would probably go, oh yeah, we could use that to like, you know, buy a year's worth of server credits or something. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So is there anything we haven't talked about that you want to add to this? I'm always sound a little bit like uh, a skeptic or maybe that it's, you know, it, it's make it sound too hard, but you know, I, I don't want to project that it's easy. Uh, at the same time though, I would say anybody listening that feels that they want to get into the nonprofit space. I say, as I would to any entrepreneur, go for it, you know, figure out what your niche is, figure out what you're good at and figure out where there's a need uh, and figure out what you're passionate about and just go for it. I mean, you know, to file online uh, is uh, relatively cheap, just the same way as starting a business. Um, but what I would always, always caution is take a strong look around and see if anybody else is doing what it is that you want to do, because unlike entrepreneurship where you can elbow somebody out, um, you know, if somebody's already doing good in that space, see if you can join forces with them and, and be a part of their nonprofit. You know, the, the one thing about this space is you really need to leave your pride at the door. If you're getting into this, cause you want to be able to say, I started a nonprofit and I'm a philanthropist. This is, you're not in it for the right reasons. So really see where that impact is and then take yourself from there. Yeah, I agree. I, I think there's a lot of good that's done where you normally never hear about it. And I think that's, that's the good that we need. Because I feel, I feel like Elon Musk would be the kind of person that like does something good and then tells everyone about it just because he wants people to know, like, I'm not so bad of a person. You know, there's memes and stuff you see online where somebody's, you know, giving food to the homeless and then they're taking a selfie as they do it. And I think there's an extremely fine line between, you know, what we coin as poverty porn, where it's, you know, hey, just look and look, look at what we're doing. I'm doing all this good. And, you know, look at these poor people and we're better than them. Let's help and using your platforms to raise awareness and to get others to join forces and to get others to donate to expand your mission so that's the other part i always caution nonprofits is know where that line is be mindful of it and make sure you're on the right side of it so i've been planning my trip to guatemala that should be going in january and i originally planned on going to guatemala like 12 years ago and it didn't work out it's fine i'm going now and when I first went, when I first was planning all those years ago, I saw this like place where you could go and teach English, like in this rural, rural area. And I was like, that sounds like a really cool way to spend like a week of my trip, you know, get, get a chance to meet a bunch of indigenous kids and, you know, help them out. Even though I used to make money from teaching English, I don't teach English anymore. Um, I, I thought it could be interesting. So like, I'm, I'm, I try to find these things because I, I don't think of it as I'm like trying to do something good. I look at it as this is an opportunity for me to have a unique experience while traveling that I would not get if I didn't do it. And if it helps people, great. I'm not going to like 
go and promote it because it doesn't do anything. But, you know, maybe I'll, I'll look for something again. I, have, I haven't really gotten deep into the planning now yet. I'm going to do more after we get off this interview. But like maybe I'll look for something like that or maybe I'll look for that place and see if they still exist. And then maybe talk about that experience in one of the episodes and promote people to, you know, because like a lot of the people that are listening are entrepreneurs and a lot of them are digital nomads as well, nomad entrepreneurs. So like we're all stressed as hell. We're all like dealing with a lot of trauma from being entrepreneurs. Like I have PTSD almost from my tech company. Like I get panic, panic attacks and anxiety. Like it's nasty. And so like, I feel like this, this would be a really great way to like spend some of that time as we, as we travel around doing cool stuff. So maybe that's an episode. First and foremost, I think you and I could set up a support group because, uh, as an entrepreneur, I can't remember the last time I didn't wake up sweating, you know, first thing in the morning, you know, panicked about what do I need to do? Uh, you know, that comes with the entrepreneurial space certainly. And, and, you know, we all you know, have to survive through that. But no, I, I love your idea. And it, it's so in line with my philosophy. So, you know, you mentioned at the the top of the show, uh, you know, my recent trip to Africa. And, and what we did on that trip is what I always try to do when we travel abroad is, you know, get out of the city center, get out of the hotel. And the best way to do it is, is find a place that you can volunteer, no matter what it is, because it's going to take you to a part of town that as a tourist, no one's ever going to see because nobody's ever going to go there. You're going to do some good and you're going to meet some real people from that country and you're going to understand it. You know, yeah, you can go to the restaurant and go to the mall and maybe you'll speak the local language a little bit and have fun while ordering your, you know, your dish. But get into the community and see what they're doing because it, it's not only going to make your vacation incredibly memorable, but you're going to be more fulfilled on that trip than you ever could be. And that was something that, you know, like I said, in Africa, we were able to do in South America and, uh, uh, it's just, it, it's a real traveler's philosophy we try to stick to. Great. So how can people follow up with you? Well, uh, by all means, I visit the the website, uh, johnthomasconsulting.com. Uh, I'm on Facebook. I'm on Instagram. So by all means, please reach out. Uh, but my contact information is on the website. I'm always willing to give some free advice. I'm always willing to point people in the right direction. And who knows, there might be an opportunity for us to work together. All right. Sounds good. Thank you very much, John. I appreciate it. So don't forget that entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you're thinking of starting a nonprofit, just know it is a lot harder than doing a for-profit for many reasons but that doesn't mean that it shouldn't be done. And if you're running a, for, a for-profit and you want to give back, there's many ways that you can do it. You've heard multiple ones here. I'm sure there's many other ways that we didn't mention, but talk to your team, see how you can support them and their desire to help and see how you can make your company better by by pushing them in that direction to help and, and putting some of your profit into helping you know uh, areas that need help. So... Uh, thanks again, John, for raising awareness about this, and uh, we'll be coming back to you next week. Sounds good, John. Thank you so much.